<laughs> Thank you. Lovely. So I had, a, I had a French grind for it all the time I was in secondary school. I hated French. I hated my French teacher was the problem. Really? Um, so I can do the French accent, no bother. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but my quality of French is fairly pathetic, to be honest. Can you tell me what do you see on your screen now? In Save College, Active Inclusion, a student perspective. So two seconds, I'm just going to... And it's okay, it's fitting the screen? Absolutely beautiful, yes. Okay, so I just wanna... Yeah, sound is perfect. Lovely. Then... Okay, I just wanna start the next, uh, just the next videos, you know. Right, I just go there. Can you hear the sound? Yes, I can. <clears throat> and him is harder to understand though. The first two seconds is no sound, that's normal. Yeah. With the tr four seconds maybe. Hello, my name is Dave Brewer and I'm a, a student in Kinsale College of Fort Okay. Magic, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to stop the share for a second. So it's back to you. And I just want to check something there now again, just for a second, okay? So go there, I just share my screen. Okay, and it's fitting exactly the Kinsale College active. Perfect, yes. Okay, so that's the first one, two seconds. I have my, my stuff ready and I'm going to open yours. Yours is slightly different so i just have to fix it there okay is it okay two seconds i want to get you back up yeah that's fine beautiful will and i try sharing that myself just to see yeah two seconds so i'll just stop oh, take your time there's no rush yeah okay i'll head off and i will where is it there it is Share and now we go into this. So is that okay for you? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Now two things. Number one, I'm conscious of the fact that when you said to me, "Is the sound okay?" I said yes. So we must remember to have the panelists' um, microphones muted when one person is talking or when there's stuff going on, um, because you know it is easy to forget to turn on and off your microphone. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is Liz and John were going to play a video, but the video is too long. It'll take over their whole session. So they're not playing any video now. Mm -hmm. um, now, I have that video and I'm going to share it down here with your patients in a second, because what I'm going to do is at the very end of the conference at four o'clock, I'm going to say, look, lads, I'm absolutely everybody is welcome to go. But if you want to stay on for another 15 minutes, I'm going to press play on this and you might like to see what the champions had to say about the UDL badge. And if you absolutely don't want to, that's absolutely fine. Okay. That sound okay? Yeah, I'm just going to, because um, I'm getting hot, like emails and all that, so I'm going to close that. Perfect. Um, okay, yeah, I think that's the way. So obviously, you, you know, when we'll be starting. So I'm, there's only, I'm only looking after really Liz, at yes. the end of the day, because yes. you're doing yours, or am I sharing I'm yours? I'm doing mine, hopefully. Yeah. There is a, one of the teachers in the group of six, I sent to stop her name, is Rachel. She has two slides to show, but we will, with your help, we will get her to share her screen. Yeah. Give her the rights to share her screen, um, because she is a panelist. Okay, um, lovely. And she will have, she has a small little video clip of dictate um, to show and that, that's it. Okay. The rest are, haven't given me anything. They know they're only five minutes to give a little bit of a spiel. Um, okay. And that is that. So I'm going to try and share this thing now and see does it work? Because I think part of what happened with it was doing the you know the digital badge for universal design for learning one of the yeah, things that really very well. most fabulous so um 
stop share. So that is and, um, and just a video, is it? It's just a video, yeah. And you want to put the PowerPoint, you know, with the thing on a slide? Are you okay to share it this way, or you just want to show the the video? I just, I think, just share it that way. It's not that hugely important. Oh, okay. And I'd say most of the people will go. Um, it's it, it's just in case some people wanted to watch it. Um, they have the option because some of them are at home on a Friday afternoon and they'll be all right. They'll have the time. Yes. Um, so, and I will be, before I press play on it, I'll be inviting everybody that wants to, to leave, panelists included. There'll be no um, um, reason for them to stay. Okay. They don't want to. Um, it's just an option. And I was going to share my screen once more just to yeah. make sure I have the, the right, because um, I want to make it fit properly. Yeah, I'm sharing a portion of screen, you know, so you don't see what you can do. You know, I don't want to see you seeing that and I don't want to press F5. So at least when you share and I can see the notes, you know, at the bottom. Yeah. Lovely. So now, yes. Okay, I have it. Absolutely trained it. to get the recognition. Fabulous. Okay, so I think we're we're okay now. You're looking fab. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I'm very yeah. happy that you see such things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Really, everything seems to be working. Yeah, thank God. Because so I can tell you the number of times I went over this to you know when I was setting it up. Yeah, you know, it's recording what we're doing at the moment. So do you want to stop it? Maybe? I don't think it is at the moment, is it? Oh, mine is written, uh, the recording is written, recording on the top and I have the pause. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, it's been recording me talking to myself, so <laughs> recording so that we remember to do it for that. Okay. Christopher Nolan, you have Dennis Underwood on Instagram. Okay, they still look the same. Yay. Wendy from CSN, Nula White, happy Friday. Hi, everyone. David, hi, Joan. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Ruth. Congratulations, Ruth. Well done, you. Deirdre here from, from KWTB. Jessica is back. Hi, Carol, everyone. Wow. So Sarah, uh, moving into the post of access um, and disability and inclusion officer in December. Brilliant. I'm delighted. Susan, hi. Queens and Belfast. Hi, Tracy. Gosh, that brings back memories of my college days regularly going up to Queens. One of my best friends is from um, Hollywood and County Down. She lives in Edinburgh now, but she's in Hollywood. Yes, Gerald, that's right. All the participants are on mute and no videos. But if somebody really wants to um, be heard, we can arrange that. My friend and colleague Farad will sort you out if and when the time comes. That's it, that's it. Hi Bridie from Sligo, welcome. Oh, Marion from Bantry, hiya. Marion and I have had several conversations lately. Kiran, you're welcome. And Catherine from Dublin. Carrie, hello my love, how are you? Carrie will be on with us. Carrie Archer should be on on the last Friday um, towards the end of that day, telling us all her news. And David O'Donovan, brilliant from Bantry. David O'Donovan is our first trainee through the door, finished both programs and ready to attack his Woodcock Johnson. So there. Okay, will I start going yep. for whoever is there?
Okay. Hi guys, Karen here. I presume I know an awful lot of you know who I am. Um, I would like to welcome you here on behalf of the Cork ETB and the Cork Active Inclusion Network to our very first webinar on inclusion. The theme for this session and these four Friday afternoons to come is the power of intention. So it was our intention to share with you our work that we're doing and also to carry forward that um, uh, community of practice that was started up at, the, at an AHEAD conference many years ago by my colleague up there, Liz Moynihan, and with the help of John Fitzgibbons. So uh, AHEAD are around in the spring. We've all been there with their conference. They were around again this summer. We're going to take up the autumn winter stint in November here. Um, and we hope you enjoy it. I have four days four Friday afternoons, they are jam packed beyond reason. Some people are barely getting two or three minutes to say what they have to say. Um, I want to introduce Farad there, who is the biggest picture on my screen at the moment. I don't know how size he is on yours. Um, but about a year ago, roughly speaking, we were both interviewed for different positions. I was appointed as active inclusion officer. Farad was appointed with a big, huge posh title. I says she looking down to read it, digital education coordinator. What a mouthful. So we call him the tell coordinator, or I'm sure there's millions of teachers out there calling him the Moodle man at the moment because he's around um, Moodle. I'd say he's dreaming of Moodle in his sleep at, uh, at this That's stage. That's it. That's it. Okay, Liz Moynihan, well, you'll be hearing lots more from her in about a half an hour's time. She is the chair of our Active Inclusion Network, which is a group of teachers from the Cork ETB and some of the managers as well. I presume you're all familiar with Zoom, says she laughing because we made a boo-boo. Um, but uh, the usual chat feature is there on the side. Please welcome, you know, introduce yourself and say hello. We will do our best to manage the chat feature and the question and answer section from this end. And if we don't, please do let us know what we're doing wrong, because this is our virgin experience. We're not like all those ahead people who are so used to doing it now they do it in their sleep. Um, so uh, all that's left for me at this stage is to, to welcome our chief executive officer. His name is Dennis Leamy, and he's going to welcome you here and say a few words. Thanks very much, Carl, and uh, indeed, uh, hello to everyone. I, I believe uh, we've got 80 people online at the moment, and I, I think from talking to Carl, there over 120 people have registered, so it's great to see so many people registered right across the country, from our colleague ET ETBs, from ETBI, uh, from uh, people, uh, from some participants in Belfast and indeed, indeed London, so you're all very welcome uh, to these uh, sessions. Could I start by thanking Carl in particular uh, for, for the invite and organizing the event, along with uh, Liz there, Liz Moynihan, chair of the Cork Active Inclusion Network. And I know that Farad, as, as Carl has referred to, has been key in providing the great technical support to ensure that this event can go ahead on a, on a virtual basis. So uh, thank you to them and a big welcome to, to you all. I want to begin by hoping that each of you are keeping well during this, these uh, extraordinary and challenging times. And would also like to state that from the outset, very much I appreciate the commitment and dedication that uh, all of you have demonstrated in each of your individual roles over what has been, I think, in any fair description, has been a very difficult and disruptive uh, time. Uh, most especially, I want to thank each of you for how you've responded to the challenges that we've faced together, often require us, requiring us to learn new and unfamiliar skills and causing us to draw upon levels of flexibility, creativity, and indeed a, a lot of innovation, uh, which we may have thought we never had. And you know what, sometimes we got it right and sometimes we got it wrong and that's, and that's okay. And I think we're learning as we go through this very period. Uh, though it seems like eons ago when all of this started, you may recall at the very start of the pandemic, uh, our fellow countryman, Dr. Michael Ryan of the World Health Organization, uh, when he was uh, asked to respond to the escalating crisis, he said that we can't sit around and wait for that perfect solution. What we need to do is work with what the best imperfect solutions available to us are right now. And to my mind, it was the most perfect explanation for the action required at that time of increasing uncertainty. Our own combined responses to the pandemic, and I say this right across the E2B sector, in particular in Cork E2B, has been without 
in no, no small measure added to our own individual understanding and exploration of the lifelong learning journey. Uh, its experience has also taught, taught us many ways to ensure that we continue to provide a pathway for every uh, learner. And for us to ensure that we provide that pathway for every learner, we too must also believe that we are also lifelong learners. So whether we're in schools, whether we're students or teachers, uh, we are lifelong learn learners in our centres of education, where we are trainees or trainers, and we are equally lifelong learners in our administrative offices as well. And I suppose each of us together, collectively, uh, we're all on our own learning pathway. So for some, it can be making the progression from one of our colleges of further education to the workplace or, or to higher education. For others, it could be rejoining the pathway at a particular time in life and enrolling for a literacy class with our team in the education unit at Cork Prison. Like the incredible, inspiring story, I, I'm sure a lot of you have seen Felicia Dyer this week in the Irish Examiner about uh, Timmy, Timmy Long. And I think I see that Adele, Adele is on the, the, one of the participants uh, on the webinar here, Adele Dean in, in, in Cork Education, uh, in the Cork Education Center in, in, the, in, the, in the prison. And the, the journey that uh, Timmy explained during the week from, from that experience, the, the literacy uh, that he engaged with in, in the prison, then into St. John's College, and then on to, to C CIT. And I suppose that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a good description of the pathway that he took and the, the lifelong learning journey that he engaged with, despite all the barriers that, that he would, would have experienced throughout, throughout life. So if you haven't seen the story, I definitely encourage you to, to read it, because it's a really good uh, testament to lifelong learning. And of course, we have, we have all been lifelong learners ourselves over the last while, working remotely from home, often from the kitchen table or the bedroom, while at the same time trying to do our best to care for those we love in our families and communities. So in, Car in Cork Education uh, and Training Board, uh, we're a, a diverse and inclusive education provider. And accordingly, our learning pathways are rightly required to be diverse and inclusive as well. And that diversity and inclusiveness is also demonstrated in the many groups that we support through funding and that we have collaborative relationships, uh, partnerships with. So uh, in relation to uh, groups working with disability, travelers, LGBTI, among uh, a, a few to mention. And CETB from our establishment, we committed to providing a pathway for every, every learner. It's the strap line in our, uh, in our, in our logo. Uh, and, we, uh, and I think everybody that's part of CETB genuinely contributes to that. There's a commitment that is also reaffirmed in our board strategy for 2017 to 2021. And I think when we build our new strategy, it's also going to be key and core to that. We're also engaged with organizations like AHEAD on the active inclusion pilot to identify a structure and approach for its further education and training services that would further support staff and their efforts to meet the needs of learners with additional needs and disabilities with the perspective that by focusing on better meeting these learners requirements, that the experience of all learners is enhanced. CTB is also building on the work and the positive outcomes from the active inclusion pilot to increase participation and engagement from the ETB uh, for all the FET centers and services. The appointment of an active inclusion support officer is a measure to support and promote the active inclusion agenda across the scheme. Also the positive outcomes from the pilot and the learnings gleaned from it were no small part due to the, due to the commitment and engagement of the staff from the participating colleges. There was a strong view by the participants that the network had changed their mindsets. Individuals were more aware of their own biases as teachers and not all learners share the same values and norms. So this conference is a mechanism over the next four weeks for practitioners to gain insights and get the benefit of others' experiences in an effort to improve the experience of all learners with, uh, for those with disabilities and additional needs being the primary focus, but what benefits one group benefits all. So the theme of today's event uh, is the power of intention. And in, in ways reminds me of uh, that poem that we've familiar to all of you, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. It begins, of course, as you know, with the traveler stopping to contemplate which path to take as the two roads diverge in a yellow wood. Acknowledging and most in keeping with recent times that we cannot always be certain of the road ahead. And as you may recall, the traveler eventually decides and says, I took one less travel by and has made all the difference. Uh, and it is hearing that final line that as chief executive of this organization, indeed being uh, part of the whole ETB sector, it makes me feel very proud uh, for, of each and every one 
uh, that's, that's involved in the in Cork E2B and the wider, sec wider sector, that in our combined endeavours, we ensure a pathway for every learner is taken and that together we are all making that difference. Gorbana Gwyd Galer. Thanks a million, Dennis. I really appreciate that. Um, and I suppose rather than waste any more time in delaying, because we have a huge packed um, program for today, we're going to introduce you now to our friend Liz, who has brought us all here after a number of years of work. And we'll let her tell you uh, how, what she did and how she did it. Um, thanks, Carl. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I'm speaking from the lovely sunny Kinsale, uh, a lovely um, town. As I hope you've all visited it. Um, this week we were um, announced as one of the friendly and nicest places to visit in Ireland. So we're, 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 we're a little bit chuffed to that today. So I hope you're all well. And I just want to speak and I've been uh, and thank you, Carl, and thank you for inviting me and all the work you've done in organizing this conference. And I just want to speak to this morning or this afternoon, the day has flown, flown for me. I just want to speak about something that's really close to my heart, and that is um, inclusion and the whole area of disability in further education. Um, for 22 years, I, I worked in a post primary school, a DESH post primary school in West Cork, and I worked in a school that had a very active and proactive um, special needs department. And I learned a lot of skills as, as a teacher and setting up uh, a, an effective special needs department in that school. And six years ago, I was very, very fortunate to move to further education and to move to a beautiful college, Kinsale College of Further Education. And when I arrived in the college, um, it had a lovely culture, a fabulous atmosphere, but I felt that the whole area of disability and inclusion um, wasn't addressed as much as it should be. And when you have in primary school, you have resource hours and you have learning support hours and you have the supports of next psychology and you have a very formal system as you have in second level, which supports students. And you indeed, you have it at higher, a higher level as well. And I felt that, um, I suppose, a, a phrase that has been quoted a few times is that further education was the Cinderella, that we didn't get the supports and that we had a lot of students in, in, in the entire population, 10% of students have disability. And we certainly had that on the ground in, in Kinsale and in the other colleges. And I went to a few conferences and I attended a few in-services on this. And I was very fortunate enough to meet with Anne Healan, who was the director of our head. And we struck up um, a friendship and a link. And we started talking about this and we said, what can be done? and was the um, existing director of um, AHEAD and she has since retired. And I suppose at that time we started talking and we started talking over the phone and we came up with a plan and we decided to do something from the bottom up. So we came together and we put a plan in place and we went to the director of further education, John Fitzgibbon in Cork E2B. And we had a meeting with John and we said, this is our plan. We want to do something for inclusion and further education. We want to do something something that can support our teachers and our colleges on the ground. And thankfully, John jumped immediately with the idea and he put, he ran things to budget for us in order to set up the active inclusion um, um, in, in our unit in Cork E2B. I'm very grateful for John to having his trust in us on that day because we came with a plan. And if I'm very honest, um, we didn't really know what we were doing. We were eager, we were enthusiastic. We wanted to do something but we didn't really know where the pilot was going to lead us. So he took a leap of faith in us on that day, ring fenced the budget so that we could meet and that we had a space for, for to meet and that um, he would provide things like refreshments when we did meet, which allowed the group to bond. And I suppose the second thing I'd like to acknowledge here as well is the principles of the five major for, uh, colleges of education in Cork. They were the College of Commerce, um, the St. John's, Colossus, Stephan, Neva, and Mallow College, and Mallow and ourselves, all of those principals um, endorsed the pilot and they um, a, appointed um, a, an active inclusion champion or a disability champion. And this was a volunteer from the staff. We were basically looking for people that maybe might be at a plateau in their career, might want to change, might want to refresh their practice, might, as Dennis referred to, just might want to be a lifelong learner and might want to learn something more so that they might be able to help their students 
that little bit better when they were in the classroom. So we met, and I can remember the first day we met. Um, now, bear in mind, these are five colleges of further education who compete with each other every September for numbers. So it wasn't the usual scenario where we met and we dined and we chatted. So we had initially to break down those barriers, but the most fabulous people came forward from those five colleges, the most enthusiastic, hardworking, diligent teachers who really wanted to embrace what we were trying to do and who really wanted to learn and they were honest and they were open. And we explained how the system was not perfect in Kinsale College. And we explained how the, it wasn't perfect in any college. We all, we all had steps to grow in this path. And like the buy-in from staff was just phenomenal. And we learned and we talked and we discussed and we moaned and we gave out and we chatted. We had professional development. We had a lot of in-service that came in, professionals who came in and guided us along the way to make sure that, um, you know, gradually that we were learning the steps of this. As well as that, we took part in the digital badge. Each one of us undertook to do what I suppose I'd refer to as the plus one, is where each teacher, we weren't, we didn't want to overwhelm staff. We didn't want to overwhelm the champions. We just asked them to do plus one. Can you do one thing in your practice and write it up in order to enhance inclusion and the practice of un universal design for learning in your college? So each of the teachers, each teaching member of that group did that and we formed part of a, a pilot. And I felt as individuals, we grew from it. We, um, we built a, a friendship um, of trust where we could share, where we can pick up the phone. We had input from career guidance teachers were on this. We had a disability coordinator who had years of experience in one college. And she was, she was very, she was the wise old owl who knew an awful lot more than the rest of us. Some of us like me was relatively new to further education who had a lot to learn. So we had all, we had all, we had fabulous people who input, who, and it's amazing when you do get the bones of 15 people into the room and when they're supported and they're given space and time, it's amazing what can come out of it. And we wanted something to happen. We didn't want just this to be a talking shop and we all sit down and, um, you know, it all be over and nothing happened. So we were very keen. So at key points, as we met, we brought in John Fitzgibbons and we put it up to him. We challenged him and we said, John, you know, we want something to happen, you know, and, you know, we, we understand that Rome is built in a day, but we wanted something to change. We wanted inclusion to be part of the further education agenda. What we really recognized was teachers in the ground were doing phenomenal work with, with little supports and little training. And they wanted to do their best for their students. They wanted to care for their students, but they were, they, you know, the systems weren't in place. And I suppose that was crucial, that that was acknowledged. And we have lots, we wrote up lots of case studies of remarkable stories in each of the five colleges that took place where teachers were going beyond the college of duty. And it was amazing what they were achieving with their students. And as well as that, we were able to go back to teachers and they were empowered by this because we acknowledged that their work was phenomenal. They were doing really, really good stuff. And it was some of it was simple stuff. But, you know, we hadn't they hadn't been given the space uh, for this to be acknowledged as something really unique and as something really helpful. That sometimes it's the simple stuff done right is really can really enhance your practice as a teacher. And I suppose we introduced them to the whole idea of universal design for learning and um, through the um, professional development. So we chatted and our group continued. And I suppose we came to the end and we produced a report. And we were very keen that this report would go somewhere and something would be done and that the powers were be. It came from the bottom up really, but we really wanted the powers at the top to come back down and listen to us. And a few things have happened as a result of the um, pilot. First of all, Solace, the power that be, looked on and they said something interesting is happening here in Kinsale and they set up the Universal Design for Learning Advisory Group and I'm very proud to be a member of that group and they are now producing guidelines for further education teachers to be rolled out nationally and that includes some of the case studies from right around the country and Cork E2B colleges so um, that, that was number one. The second thing was, um, I suppose we were constantly, or I certainly was constantly, and some of the other members were as well on the, a soapbox that the HEA 
who are distributing the funding for students with disabilities too late in the year. And the students were halfway through their academic year by the time they got it. This year, the power of, of um, giving out that fund is coming back down to the ETBs. And the hope is that we will be able to get funding to students earlier in the academic year so that we can put proper systems and support in place. And I suppose the second uh, and the third thing is that there was a specific budget by Solace Ring Fenced for inclusion. As well as that, we set up our own active inclusion officer and Carl, who has coordinated this conference here today and was appointed last March. So now there is a specific person in our ETB in Cork ETB to drive the inclusion agenda, to organize conferences like this today and to get this agenda to understand that something has to be done and that we need, we've a bit done, we've, we've loads more to do and that that will be Carl's role going forward is to continue to drive and we're delighted that we have a specific person now, it's a specific goal person that we can ring, we can talk, we can chat in order to make sure that the students on the ground get exactly um, what they need. So I suppose we're very proud of what, is, what it has achieved and um, I, again, I come back to the fact it's amazing what you can achieve when you get willing people into a room who are willing to work and willing to listen and willing to chat. And when we share practice and we learn from each other. And in the process of all of this, we're obviously delighted as well that we were, uh, as a result of doing this, we were achieving one of the strategic goals in Corky to be around inclusion. So we were ticking lots of boxes by doing this programme. And I think when each of the participants or the champions of um, who were involved in the pilot went back to their colleges and um, they gave us phenomenal testimonials as, at the end of it, saying how much um, they, they grew as a teacher and how much it improved their practice and how it opened up to a whole new world of how they interact with their students. So um, that's our story. Um, I'm delighted to hear to tell it. Um, I, um, I just want to again acknowledge um, Cork to be support right throughout this support, right throughout this process. And no matter what I wanted when we were meeting, I always asked for food because I live in near Kinsale and I love eating. So I always said to John, give us a, you know, when we met, we used to just having a cup of coffee and some sandwiches. You know, when the, our first meeting, we had dinner. There was, you know, it was it was little things like that that just got the group to bond and that was needed. And I think the outcomes speak for themselves. So Carl, I want to thank you and I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks a million, Liz. Um, and as one of those champions of disability, which feels like about 10 years ago now, um, I certainly agree. We were absolutely spoiled rotten. We were brought to hotels. We were wined and dined um, no on several occasions. We were, well, okay, not wine, maybe, but um, we were <laughs> given plenty. Um, we were very much treated. So as part of, uh, Christine Hines there from ahead has sent you on the link for the document that we produced um, at that time. And as part of that as well, Dara Ryder, who's now the head of ahead, put together a video for us um, of all of the champions of disability. So we were going to show it today at this point, only it's 15 minutes long. And um, the more time goes by, the more our sessions get squashed with people who want to say something about what they're doing. So what I've decided is at four o'clock today, this webinar is supposed to finish and everybody in Sundry is welcome to leave at that time. But I am going to, for those of you that have the time and want to stay on for this clip, I'm going to press play on it. And as soon as it's finished, then um, at quarter past, you know, a few minutes after quarter past four, that will be it. You're under no obligation to stay, but just if you want to see what people had to say and see what they got out of it, um, you're, you're very welcome to do so. So I think it's, I'm up next, Farad, am I? Farad says, yes, Carol. Who are you telling? Okay. Okay, I must get rid of these guys. Right. So, Carolina, you know who I am, Corky to be. When um, lockdown happened last March, um, as we've said, I had been offered my job as inclusion officer at Christmas, but because we were in the middle of the year, I was still teaching. So, um, 
as lockdown happened, I had kind of a half of one foot in the active inclusion job and the rest of me was still teaching psychology, nutrition, anatomy and physiology to about 207 learners. So it was kind of a crazy time. I could write a book on it. In fact, I might someday. Um, but in the meantime, what we're concerned about here, our intention here in the Cork ETB was to look and see how did our learners get on. So I can tell you how mine got on and I can give you my experience. Liz can tell you all sorts of um, information as well. And I'm sure there's millions of you out there um, or all a hundred of you out there listening to us um, can give their opinion. So what we did is we decided if you're going to find out how somebody feels or what they think about something, the best way to do it is to go and ask them. Aintus had put together a lot of research and they put a questionnaire together. We took that questionnaire, we took some bits of it, we took out others, we added bits of our own and we sent one out. On that note, I must say, by the time all of us were finished with our frantic getting students sorted, getting them over the finish line, making sure they're okay, making sure their certs were ready to go out, etc. Um, this questionnaire was then put out. So by the time it went out, an awful lot of our learners were already gone. So in the Cork ETB, we have 31,000 learners in the books last year. And this questionnaire went out to all secondary school students and all FET learners that we have. Up there on this side, you can see the dark green um, part of the circle represents 43% of our learners who were secondary school students who answered this questionnaire. We got 1,097 people that answered the questionnaire. So while out of a body of 31,000 isn't a huge amount, then 1,097 people matter. Um, and these are the results I'm presenting today. So it says here they answered 62 questions. There was actually 19 questions in the questionnaire, but when you take all the different ticks and, and everything else that were in the questions, and you put it into an Excel sheet. The Excel sheet that I've worked off to get this the data for you has 62 columns in it. Um, so it was anonymous. There were, mo except for what school or college they were attending, mostly females filled this out. Um, there were 30% males, 2% non-binary, 2% preferred not to say what they were, and one person wanted to dis uh, describe themselves their own way. Our students ranged in ages from 13 years to 65 years. You can see down the bottom here, the second last line represents the 16 year olds to 18 year olds. So you could take about four or five percent off that, um, which are people who belong to youth reach and further ed, the very much younger end of, of further ed. Um, but the rest, the bottom two lines are predominantly secondary school students and all the other lines up here are further ed. And please notice we have nearly 5% of the people that answered this questionnaire were over the age of 65 and 16% of them are between the ages of 45 to 64, which is where Carol belongs. Okay, we move on. This other statistic I found interesting. The ones before come from the start of the questionnaire. This one comes from the end of the questionnaire. Um, why it's interesting is that we, the students were asked to indicate by a tick whether they were from direct provision, born outside of Ireland, they had a disability, they were a lone par parent, English wasn't their first language, or they were a traveler. These are the results that we received. However, exactly 50% of the respondents never answered this question. Now, some of the people that didn't answer were secondary school students and others um, were not. Whether they didn't answer because it was gone to the end of the questionnaire or not, I, I, we don't really know, but we will modify that and have a look at that for the next session. So that's who we had that answered the questionnaire. Now we'd like to know what were they doing during lockdown? So the first question we asked was, did you have access to a computer? And I found this result really, really surprising at 86% said that they did, because I certainly out of my students, a huge number of them were on smartphones and they had very, very minimal access to anything else. So where were they doing their work? 41% of them did it at a desk that was private to them. 
The next favorite place was at the kitchen table. Then it was they were on their bed. They were at a desk that they shared with somebody else on a sofa. This 3.5% represents other, and I'll speak about that in a second, and 1%. So there was a good few people there who um, did their study and everything outside. We did have wonderful weather at the time. I do remember that vividly. So other here, we had all sorts of answers for this. Most of the answers were uh, any one of the above that I could get, you know, a space to work on. Some of them were gone out into the drive to their mother's cars and their father's cars. One guy was actually gone out into the caravan that was parked outside the house. Um, some of them were gone to dad's office, etc. What did they use to do their work? They used a personal laptop or computer that they had access to. Um, that's 468 people use that. That's 42% of the people that answered this questionnaire had a laptop to answer or uh, to do their work, I should say. 263, that represents a little over 23%, were, did all the work in COVID on a smartphone. 200 people used the uh, shared laptop. Then it went down to tablets used only by the person themselves. 21 people received stuff from their centre by post and 21 people posted stuff back to whatever centre we're talking about. And 12 people had a tablet that was owned by family. When they were asked what kind of connection they had with um, their school or college or centre and how the people were connecting, three quarters of them said that they were connected uh, by email. A little over half of them, close to a, two thirds of them said it was Teams or Zoom, or Zoom I should say. Then we came down to the phone, WhatsApp, 10% other, which I'll talk about in a sec, 10% by post. And down here in the no contact, we had 16 people. So 16 people out of 1,097 had no contact. Some of those, if you look back through the other answers that they gave, they had no contact because they just cut off. They wanted absolutely no contact. Others had no contact and perhaps well, a few of them, one or two of them anyway, it was because of technology and others, I can't answer for you why it was. Um, in this more, or this other section here, which has 10%, um, the things that they used most often were Edmodo, Google Classroom, Moodle, Slack, Facebook, and one person had Seesaw. <clears throat> so we know who they were, we know what they were doing and how they were doing it. Now we'd like to know what their feelings were about the whole scenario. Were they happy with the level of engagement they had with their college? Well, you can see here the two bottom lines represent an agree and a strongly agree um, that they do. And that represents 76.6% of them said yes, they agree. So that again, three quarters said yes. Um, 2.7% strongly disagreed uh, and 5.8% disagreed, <coughs> excuse me. I felt supported to succeed during this time. Um, again, we have the strongest agree and um, agree and strongly agree statistics are down here and we're talking about 69.9% or 70% of the students um, were felt supported during this time. We do have 9.4% and 2.8%, which represents 12% or 12.2% that said they didn't feel that they got enough support. When they were asked would they prefer to go back to the way things were before COVID and have the classrooms as they were always for many, many years, you can see here 50% strongly agreed they wanted to go. You add that to the agreed section and again you have at least two thirds of them that wanted to wanted the old uh, reality that we had. What did you miss most about the face-to-face -face contact? Well, the things that they missed most, these, these were answered, they had a space to answer their own answer. They missed their friends and the social aspect. They missed being able to ask questions of their teachers. They missed practical classes. They missed playing music. They missed sport. <clears throat> they miss getting out of the house and a lot of the people that said getting out of the house were not the older learners that answered this questionnaire. There were an awful, an awful lot of the youngsters that said they wanted to get out as well or they liked getting out of home. 
I take in more in the classroom because of the distractions at home. They liked having fun. And lots of them, many, many, many of them said nothing. They liked everything about working online. So what worked well for you in, during lockdown? I got more done at home. They loved being able to rewind recordings and go at their own pace. They loved, the, some of them loved the flexible hours. Please note the ones that I have put in order here, the ones at the top were answers that were given more frequently. My tutors were great to check on my progress. They got a lot of personal attention and they liked getting stuff electronically because it was very easy to find it. Lots and lots and lots of them expressed various forms of love for Zoom. Um, we had a lot of people that said they liked everything about lockdown and equ not equally, but almost equally, we had people saying they didn't like anything about it, that it wasn't affected, or my favorite bugbear here, I don't know, miss. Um, I put in the last one here. I liked the way that we all pulled through and helped each other. And um, there were a good few of those, and I just thought it was worth noting. So other incidental statistics, 44% of the people that answered were people with disabilities. 35.5% of the people that answered said they needed one-on-one -on -one support. And these were not always the people that ticked, I have a disability. 40% of the people st said straight off that they had suffered some mental health issue or they had mental health um, concerns during uh, lockdown. 12% suffered a bereavement. Over 50, or almost 50% of them struggled with a lack of structure in their day and over 50% of them said that they found it difficult to stay motivated. So to finish up, what are our lessons learned? Um, when asked what would make remote learning easier for learners next year, their answer was one place to go to and store all of the course material. Are you listening to that, Farad? A proper schedule for classes. Well, we've had timetables and we've had them rescheduled and then we've had more timetables all around the country for level five. Um, a platform and tutorials on how to use that platform. A better laptop. In fact, some of them just wanted a laptop full stop with Wi-Fi and our, our rental scheme for laptops. And we, as many other ETBs, are providing a loan scheme for laptops at the moment work experience needs to have an alternative. So we did have some kind of a bit of an alternative for students who couldn't finish off their hours last time round, um, but they did acknowledge that we need something more concrete there. Being allowed to chat to mates on Zoom, not always just in college and on work. So in other words, teachers out there, when you're on Zoom or whatever it is, whatever platform with your students, it's not a bad idea to just walk out of the room every now and then and leave the lads chat away to themselves because they really do get benefit from this. And there were lots and lots said, they just didn't know. So next year, in fact, between now and Christmas, we're going to tweak the questionnaire that we had um, and we're going to send it out again and we're going to send it out to a whole much larger group of students and um, you know, watch this space and we'll tell you what results we come up with. That's me. Okay, I got the thumbs up there from Farad, so I'm doing okay. All right. Are we okay, everybody? So Farad, um, Liz has organized for um, two of her students who they were to present at the AHEAD conference, isn't that right, Liz? Um, uh, last year, but when it went online and we were all doing COVID and everything else, we they just we were we thought we'd take a kinder route, or Liz thought she'd take a kinder route with them, and um, but they are here, and um, for us, and um, we have a little video clip to show you, which does promote Kinsale and rightly so, and the boys are in that, and then once that's finished, if you have any questions for the boys. They are young men, I should say. They are here to um, answer some questions for you. Do you want to say some more, Liz, and welcome your boys? Um, thank you, Carl. Um, um, so I have here two young gentlemen, um, Christopher Good and um, David O'Regan. And um, I'm down here in my office in Kinsale College, and they are upstairs socially distancing uh, with Angela Fahey, the personal assistant. 
who's um, supporting him today. Um, they're at their first um, conference ever. They're two amazing students. And I talk a little bit about them later on, but I just want to welcome them and you'll have an opportunity to ask them questions um, later. So Farad, if you might just, um, Farad is, doing, is my IT technician. He's helping me out because there's some video content in my presentation. And I got a little bit nervous earlier today about my videos and I rang Farad for a bit of help. So he's going to um, uh, share the sc his screen now with my presentation and move it along as I speak. Thank you, Fred. I'm doing that now, okay? Great. Great, so there it is. It's just, again, it's about a student perspective and we wanted to get the voice of students to what they say about what we do in, in Kinsale College. So just a few key facts uh, about the college. It's located in the beautiful coastal town of Kinsale. It's world renowned for its excellent restaurants and seafood in particular. And one of our main claim to fame is the college um, is one of the first in the world to offer a permaculture course and sustainability um, course in horticulture. And we feel we were very tuned into the whole climate action um, uh, priorities long before it became a political priority in Ireland. In fact, only this uh, very week, we have been named the first college of further education in Munster to be awarded on Tashka Green Campus Award. So I've just a short little video clip now that I'd like you to watch um, that captures that Green Campus initiative. <laughs> We're absolutely thrilled to get the recognition of Green Campus status here, which is national recognition. However, what a lot of people might know is we've been doing this for the past 20 years. We've been promoting the green agenda here at Kinsale College. It's in our DNA. It's in everything we do, included in every one of our courses that we have here at the college. This is great news, but it hasn't come from nowhere. Transition Town Movement started here in a classroom in Kinsale College over 20 years ago. It's now a global movement, so we are extremely proud of that. I used to work in Pierce College, so they had an established green committee and green campus there. Um, so I just thought when I transferred to Kinsale College that it's, it's just a great formal structure that adds in so many aspects to sustainability. And it's, it's formalised, you have the waste, the water, the energy, the biodiversity, procurement, so you can just start working away. I was the chairperson for the Green Campus at Kinsale College last year and we did a whole variety of little events um, based at the college but we invited the public in as well. First ones we did was a biodiversity day where we were showing people how to make bat boxes and doing wildflower mats and kind of getting people into the idea that they can create a habitat wherever they are for wildlife. We had a really good time organising and actually doing the swap shop where people would bring in clothes that they didn't want anymore and hopefully get something out of it, swap it for another piece of clothing, which was really fun. We did another really cool activity just around sustainability and seed saving, uh, which was grey crack, um, and people were very motivated and interested. And we hope that we're influencing people, and that's one of the key aspects of the Green Campus uh, designation is that it's not just a bubble, it's like you're trying to influence some people by putting up posters, by bringing in other courses, and then like linking in with the community as well. So one of the things we've done here in the college is we've made contact with local primary schools, we've created gardens with them. Um, there's an awful lot more to do and as soon as we're allowed and able to get access to more schools um, and do more outreach work, that, that's our next step, that's where we want to go. Great, thank you, um, Farad. So that's some of our amazing team at the college and um, we're delighted with that news this week. So we're just a small college with just 280 students ranging from ages 18 to 80. And this photo here, um, taken in very different times, obviously. Um, these days now, we know we're, we're social distancing and masks and all that come with, with it. But the camaraderie and the sense of fun that you see here, it, we're trying to keep that as much as possible uh, very much alive in our virtual campus um, at the moment. Um, this year's batch of students um, come from over 15 countries, um, European-wide, and so people don't just come from Ireland to study, you can say they actually come from right uh, across the, the continent to study here at the college. Many of our students have additional needs. They're either diagnosed or underdiagnosed. We'd have students returning to education 
after perhaps a negative experience when they were possibly there 10, 15 or 20 years ago. We have 20 courses in total in offer. And last year in 2019, we were blessed, and I mean blessed, because we rolled out cutting edge educational technology for all our staff and students. It was a huge project that involved giving every teacher a digital device in order to aid their teaching and learning. And it involved a whole range of CPD and um, professional development support uh, in small groups to teachers because we felt teaching te teachers to use the technology in small groups or even one-to-one, -one, we got the best buy-in and they really got conference about using that education technology in the classroom. So we were very lucky that we had rolled out this project because little did we know what was going to, what was ahead of us in, in a few short months. In March, the first lockdown came. Like every other third level institution in the country, um, we had to close our doors. But the difference is that we were in a great position. We were just so, so fortunate to deliver our courses remotely. Um, we had already put the foundations in place. All of our teachers had uploaded all of their co course content and all of our students had access to it. Um, so we were very early adapters of video conferencing. We had our first staff meeting on Teams that very first um, week um, after lockdown. But one of our biggest um, topics on the agenda at the staff meeting was how in the name of God were we going to stay connected with our students when we couldn't meet them. We were thinking not of all of our students, but we were most concerned about the students who find academic work challenging for various reasons. How could we continue to support them when we could no longer meet them? So we knew that video conferencing alone was not going to be enough for our students. So we quickly put a plan in place. So our staff arranged regular phone calls, in some cases on a daily basis with students who needed reassurance and practical help um, to get through the rest uh, of the course. These calls, we feel, gave students an opportunity to ask questions about something that was bothering them, get a bit of guidance on how to tackle assignment, or even just a chat and give them a few encouraging words along the way that would um, motivate them to get up to speed um, with their assignments. And um, all this work paid off and we we're extremely proud of the retention figures of our um, 2020 students. And actually in some of our courses, our retention figures were actually higher than the previous years. So we feel that the one-to-one, -one, the chat, and a lot of the stuff that Carl would have mentioned, the suggestions in her presentation, uh, um, it, it, they resonate with me because that is exactly what we picked up anecdotally on the ground as well. So now I want to introduce two students of the college. Um, first of all, we have two short little videos um, for them that just explain their experience of um, education as how they experienced it in Kinsale College. So first of all, we have Christopher Good. So, and, and you can just watch um, uh, Christopher perform here in this little video. Hello, my, my name is Christopher Good and I, I am 21 years old and I would like to speak to you about being a student at Kinsale College, County Cork. I grew up in Kinsale and did my secondary school education there as well. Luckily for me, Kinsale College was right on my doorstep. In 2018, I took up a place... Sorry. ...years old and I would like to speak to you about being a student at Kinsale College, County Cork. I grew up in Kinsale and did my secondary school education there as well. Luckily for me, Kinsale College was right on my doorstep. In 2018, I took up a place on the multimedia course at Kinsale College. Lots of elements of the course appealed to me, especially the filmmaking. Our class also had the opportunity to visit the filming set in RT, which was so much fun. We got to see behind the scenes and meet some of the film crew. One of my favorite ex experiences during the multimedia course was our art exhibition. Our class had to organize an exhibition evening, design a poster to advertise the event, and set it up on the day. We were able to sh showcase our projects to our family, friends, and the general public. We had a great evening. Currently, I am studying film and TV, which I am enjoying very much. 
Kinsale College, I have an assistant who is with me most of the time. She helps me with taking notes in class. I talk to her about my assignments and we work on them together. She helps me with any problems I may have. If I didn't have help from a PA, I think I might slip back in the class. I am very grateful for the help I was given. The college has given me the use of a laptop computer to access Office 365. My class are also very kind to me and they always make me feel included and then they say I make them smile when I tell a joke in class. I think life is too short to be serious all the time. Overall, I feel like I've learned so much during my time here at Kinsale College. I've learned lots of new skills and I've made lots of good friends. I feel like my future is bright. So bright, I gotta wear shades. Christopher um, and Christopher really is an amazing student and um, you'll have an opportunity to ask um, just at the end you'll have an opportunity to ask Christopher um, questions um, he's online and he's with us here today and um, so if you have any questions um, um, feel free to ask him at the end of the session so now I want to introduce another student of Kinsale College uh, a young man from Kerry but we won't hold that against him um, called David O'Rourke and um, David O'Rourke is with us as well um, this afternoon and I'll ask you Fred there just to play um, David's video so you can get a uh, capture and um, what has David's experience been at studying at Kinsale College. Hello, my name is David O'Rourke and I'm a, a student in Kinsale College of Further Education. I come from Castle Island County, Kerry. I'm 30 years old and have a condition called Asperger's Syndrome. After completing my leave in SOS, I studied for a diploma in civil engineering and found it very hard because I got very little support. Then I went to IT Chile and studied business studies from year 2010 to year 2013. I really enjoyed my time there. I got the support that I needed to achieve my level 6 diploma. In 2017, I got the opportunity to move away from home and study in Kinsale College, which is a small college of further education situated approximately 45 minutes outside Cork City. I went to room in Kinsale and live independently, making my own choices, which is very important to me. Since 2017, I have studied sustainable horticulture and permaculture. I have successfully completed level 5 in 2019 and in level 6 in 2020. That permaculture course has opened my eyes to the world of sustainability and biodiversity and how we can protect and enhance our environment. We learned how to make the soil fertile without chemicals and we helped communities to plant their own food. I would have found the courses very challenging without the support I got from my tutors and my personal assistant. They are very understanding and helpful. This year I am studying Art Level 5 and I love it. My classmates have become great friends. We help each other all the time. Coming to Kinsale College has changed my life. I'm working towards financial independence, which I wanted since I was 16. I feel I am in the right place for me. It's a very friendly environment. And I have friends and staff who make me a cup of tea when they are making one for themselves. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I have to tell you that Kinsale College is my cup of tea. Um, so that was David's um, contribution. So thank you, David and Christopher. I know you're on standby, and I'd now like to ask if anybody, I think we've over 83 people online, if there's anybody um, th that would like to either ask myself or David or Christopher a question. If somebody wants to ask questions, they can hear themselves, just put it in the text and I will allow you to, to talk, okay?
I think it's supposed to give the, the, the both boys an opportunity to speak. So, um, David, I might ask you first a question. Um, do you want to just say something about your experience in Kinsale College? Uh, first of all, do I have to take off the mask? You can take it off, David, while you're speaking. Uh, I have just done this. Well, we can't see you, David. We can just hear you. So you can relax. So could, could you repeat the question, Liz, please? Um, I'm just asking David, would he like to just say something um, to the audience about his experience in Kinsale College? Uh, I'd like to say also that, and this just came into my head not long ago, that Kinsale has the advantages of both a small town and a place much bigger due to its proximity to Cork City. That if you you can this you can afford the benefits of a lively small town in Kinsale, but if you want the benefits of a city, Cork City is only at the most thirty kilometres away, and it's easy to travel to. Or, or in normal circumstances, it is. Yeah. So the benefit of of studying in Kinsale, the benefits of a small town in the city. I couldn't agree with you more, Chris or, or David. I you couldn't I couldn't put it better either. So well done. And Christopher, would you like to say anything um, on behalf on, on your experience of studying or your your level five course? Or is there anything that comes to mind that you'd like to contribute to the say to the audience? Well, I've well I, I've been studying here, here for well three three years now, and in my three years, thankfully, all, all the teachers that that I met, all the staff staff that that's been working with me and all the teachers that I've had are honestly ve very nice and very helpful. I'm honestly very ha happy and it's honestly a privilege to to even be going here. So so I would just, just like to say if any uh, of you have uh, any students that that need, that need help, you would, uh, you would honestly get, get it here because I, I've been here for three years uh, and in those three years I I have I have never once fe felt, negle felt neglected. I've always fe felt felt like I've been helped by, by all the staff, and they're all ve very, very kind to me. And I I would like to to thank you, you, Miss Moynihan, for for giving me the the opportunity to, to uh, speak uh, and just for being in this conference in general. Thank you so much, Christopher. And I guarantee the audience I have not paid Christopher or prompted him in, in any way, but he couldn't, in fairness, have given us any stronger testimonial for the college um, in, in what he just said. So thank you, Christopher, for your kind words. And it's lovely as well to be acknowledged by, by um, students because I can pass those kind words back to our staff now next Monday morning. And I guarantee you, it will pip. We, we are human beings after all. It will put, we like getting compliments. We like being told that our college is good and when we work very hard and we, our teachers like getting that praise. And I'd be delighted, Christopher, to pass back your message that on this public forum, you acknowledge them for the good and the kindness and the hard work and, the, and that you appreciated this and you acknowledged it at this conference today. So thank you so much for that, Christopher. And I'd also like uh, to thank David for his kind words. And is there any other question there, Carl? Yes, Rachel Abram is in the audience there. She'd like to ask a question. I'm trying Hi. to find her name. Hi, Rachel. Hi, hey, Carl. Hi. I just had a question there for David. I was intrigued by the, the course choices that he made. I think he started in civil engineering and went into permaculture and is now doing art. And I was wondering, is he planning to bring all of these skills together in some wonderful um, occupation down the road? Is he planning world domination with all of these uh, skills coming together? I thought this permaculture could be combined with, we say, certain aspects of the business studies course to promote sustainability and to promote the benefits of uh, more sustainably produced food and etc. Okay, and, and the art is going to help you as well, David, is it? Will it help you with your designs and stuff, maybe, of, of gardens and things? Or uh, Actually, as for the art, I'm, make, I'm taking a significant number of photographs on Kinsale on my Instagram account since 
spoon of this year. I have 41 photographs and most of them are just around Kinsale Town. I will best of luck with that and thanks for answering my question. Thank you. There is a question from Mary, uh, Carol, Liz and Dennis. And the question is, is the PA provided by the ETB? The PA is provided by the ETB through a fund. It used to be provided through um, HEA funding, but now Solus have taken that over. So we're just, I'm managing it um, with the help of John and a whole lot of people in HR and accounts, I can assure you. Um, so there is a certain fund for people who are registered with the disability offices in our further ed colleges, yes. Is that it? There was one other question up, up, uh, up the way. Actually, from somebody. I think okay. Christine Hines, does Christopher and David have any tips on how we can help support students while teaching remotely? Uh, well, well, I, I would just, I would just say like actually be, be there for the, the students. Like, like if, if I was talk, talking to someone, actually try to explain, explain it well because. It, it's all it's all well and good if, if let, let's say I was do, doing an, assi an assignment but but if it if it wasn't expl explained like well to me I w wouldn't be able to do that and that's w wouldn't be my fault or, or the teachers I'm not trying to blame anyone here but but I say I say just try try and like be be with with the students and and actually like just Talk, talk to them because even if they have like a, di a disability or or the, let's just say autistic or what, whatever, just try find like talk talk to them and be be patient because everyone is different. Yeah, thank you. And if possible and if appropriate, maybe a tutor could give ev advice on healthier reason and healthier dice to the student. And if you're wondering why I said that, I'm saying it because your physical health is connected to your mental health. If you improve your physical health and improve which improves your mental health, you will be able to, to study better and more effectively. There is a question from Brenda O'Connell and Nessa Fitzgerald, and one of them is for staff now, uh, if you have, or the lads as well, um, and uh, how to become more inclusive, if you had any tips how, how to become inclusive, and what was the biggest challenge from Nessa? Is that question for David and Christopher? I think so, and as well. I, for I'll probably take it um, for uh, if that's okay. I think really it's about it, it, for the college, and maybe it was somewhat easier for us with a smaller college, which was to build that culture of inclusion where everybody could be different. And you know, it, it just takes a little bit of while. You need training, you need the CPD, um, but eventually it will seep into the walls of your of your college. If, if that's what everybody does, if it's, a, if, if it's a culture where no matter what your disability or no matter what your difficulty, it's okay. And you know, that supports are there and that everybody can achieve their personal best. Um, and it's about working with the ability as opposed to the disability. And uh, I suppose it takes a number of years to build that culture of inclusion. Um, and I'd be really strong in that is just have buy-in for everybody from the caretaker to the cleaner to, you know, the entire college community to have, you know, so everybody, like we've one student who has difficulty coming off the bus in the morning. And I know the caretaker would help uh, sometimes step in and help that student. And, you know, if there's just buy-in from everybody to the whole area of inclusion um, and it becomes the norm of what we do, um, you know, it, it, it becomes easier. Brilliant. Thanks a million, everybody, for all of that. And thank you, David and Christopher, especially. That's a, a big deal to come online and, and a program like this. Um, and thank you, Liz, for all the work that you do and that you encourage. 
So for our last session today, we have six um, members of staff. Um, they are teachers and we have um, managers. They're representing all sorts of areas within the Cork ETB. When we started in the 1st of October, we started with 65 people doing the UDL badge in our digital badge training. We lost a few of them, as did a lot of the ETBs around the country, because some teachers were just completely overwhelmed. There was one teacher and she was spreading herself between three colleges and three timetables, etc. So she'll come back in January and do it again when things are settled down. Um, and blended learning was, was just very difficult for lots of people. So we have our first person online. They're going to tell us basically Hello. about what kind of redesign activity they have put in place um, with their students this year. Uh, some of them have it completely done and they've feedback on it. Some of them are just about to finish it. The deadline for this 10 week course, the deadline for submission of their assignment is the 10th of December. So hats off to all of these people that are still here and doing some fantastic work. Um, a few years ago when we were all champions, Helena, Helena, like myself, was one of those champions and we did our digital badge and when we went to Dublin, Helena was the person to win the John Kelly Award. So she is one of our very famous colleagues here in the Cork ETB. So she's heading off the UDL badge people today. Off you go. Um, thanks very much, um, Carol. Uh, yeah, as I said, I was probably the only Cork person to go up to Croke Park in the last couple of years and collect a trophy. So there you go. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to, this sounds like a board fall chat for Kinsale College, but anyway, um, <laughs> I teach um, uh, in Kinsale College and um, I'm uh, also the learning support coordinator um, as well in the college. And I teach primarily in healthcare. And uh, as Liz pointed out, you know, it's been a baptism of fire since March in relation to kind of our teaching practice and how it's flipped in its head from going, you know, to the traditional route in the classroom to um, a lot predominantly for me, because I teach in healthcare, a lot of it online. So I suppose what's really interesting um, is that how I was going to keep the UDL component of my teaching practice, which I'm so proud to be an advocate of, as you well know. And um, I really had to think on my feet and get very creative. So I'm just going to share just something that I've done and it might, you know, inspire other people as well. Um, so I teach a level six uh, supervisory management course in health services. And every year, traditionally, we do uh, because they do a disability module as part of their course. And of course, I promote UDL within that uh, module to them. We go and we do a walkability audit of consent town so that's where collectively as a group we go down into Kinsale we look how accessible it actually is and the students find it brilliant and they really enjoy it it gets us out in the fresh air gets us walking and doing all those things but they also I suppose see you know the the maybe how far ahead sometimes and how back we are in relation to accessibility and and disability in that and this year I was scratching my head because I didn't want to lose that component of it. It was a really great practical point. They write up their learner record entry on it um, and they also integ integrate it into a couple of other components. So Helena discovered the power anyway of Google Earth and um, uh, started exploring Google Earth and uh, remotely what the students did all together as part of their online kind of classroom structure. We went into Google Earth and we did our walkability um, audit uh, through Google Earth um, and Kinsale um, Town, which they really enjoyed. And I suppose when you look at the three components of UDL, which is engagement, it was really visual, it was different, it was, you know, um, from what they were usually doing like from the representation we were looking at I suppose using a Google Earth as a forum and now for action and expression and you know they're going to be writing it up as part of their learner records but actually one of them came back to me and said can we not do this on where we come from and I said sure absolutely why not so our little walkability audit which traditionally was always done in Kinsale has now moved from Bandon to Cork to the Ivory Coast to Hungary, to South Africa, 
um, to all these different countries that the students would have originally been from. And they're bringing these little walkability audits and accessibility audits of their own areas where they were traditionally from back into the classroom. And I suppose it has engaged the students, it's lit a fire under them really, um, uh, in relation to, I suppose, you know, inclusivity um, and celebrating all that is unique. The students together have learned so much about each other. They've learned about different countries and different areas that we never thought first day would happen traditionally through doing a disability um, module as such. So I know Carly gave me very little time to talk and I love talking. Um, so I'm kind of just going to wrap up from a UDL perspective. I really would encourage teachers and people to be as creative as possible. Try everything and anything now online. We have, we have this huge opportunity to be as creative as we can to engage people. Um, explore apps have fun with it the students will appreciate that be prepared to fail you're not going to get everything right you know it's not going to all work out brilliantly first day for you but the students appreciate you in the trying of it and the doing of it and explaining to them why you're doing it and um that's really it and to those who are doing their digital badge the best of luck <laughs> thanks amelia and elena and um, now, how about following that, Niamh? No bother to you, I'm sure. Um, Niamh is going to tell us about some of the things that she's doing. She's one of our first raw recruits into this digital badge training just last month. Off you go, Niamh. Thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, how am I going to follow that is right. Um, okay, so I'm a teacher of early to University of Design for Learning when I worked in Kinsale College with Liz Moynihan and Helena Farrell. So as you heard from both of them, they really do believe in inclusive education. And for the years that I worked there, I really saw that in action in all aspects of the learning experience. So as a member there of the care team, we continuously looked for different ways to help various learners. And I suppose from an early years perspective, I'm going to rob, um, a statement from Ashtar and ensure every single person could be a competent and confident learner. So this year, starting in a new college, I knew that the UDL badge was both a personal and a professional goal for me. So with a little guidance and persuas persuasion from Carol Neenan, um, I signed up and got stuck in. So something at the beginning that Helena Farrell said really stuck to me, and that was inform your learners what you're doing in terms of the UDL badge. So I did two things. I spoke with my classes and I then composed an email along with the survey so I could send that to my learners and it aimed to kind of find out what I could do from, for them from their perspective. So with that, I got 50 responses, which was their ideas, their opinions, and it gave me an insight into what I could do for them, both short term and long term, to create a more inclusive classroom and learning environment where everyone could engage, enjoy themselves and reach their individual potentials. So these results then led to some changes that I made immediately. So over 90% of my learners felt that having classmate time would be something that would benefit them. As many of us have experienced ourselves, college is a place to get support from classmates, make friends for life and sometimes even give out about us teachers. So that aspect um, is something that is pretty much non-existent at the moment due to COVID. And as learners are not physically in the college or classroom, I really empathized with them, them that they weren't getting the full college experience, I suppose. Um, so firstly, I then stole an idea from the UDL badge and I created peer groups for maybe four to five learners in each class. So these groups like the UDL peer groups, they act as a support system, a discussion space, and a motivation technique when you feel it's all too much. So these have been working really well since I introduced them a few weeks ago, and I noticed huge changes in learners' interactions, particularly in the learners that would be much more quieter. Um, so them interacting then in our online classes when we have the larger groups. So then I allocated a weekly designated remotely to discuss assignments, chat about life, and have a safe space where they can interact with each other without a teacher, 
creating the next best thing to the social aspect of college life. So again, feedback from this has been really positive with learners making friends and engaging with each other through phone calls and various other social media outlets on evenings and weekends. So that really benefits then inside the classroom because learners feel more comfortable with each other. So finally, over 80% of my learners this year are under the age of 23 and 70% of them come straight from their leaving cert. So when only 12% said they were confident completing assignments in the survey, I knew that this was something I needed to look at also. So while we create briefs and guidelines for our learners, I wanted to do something a bit more. And so I created an assignment template where I laid out guidelines and word counts along with different links and ideas for various aspects of the assignment. So this template was optional. And while it was created mostly for the, to assist the learners who came directly from school and maybe didn't really know the expectations of QQI assignments, many other learners choose to use them also. So they use them and they became comfortable with them. And I feel now that now they are more comfortable with completing assignments, I can look at different ways then for them to represent their learning. So that I think sums up some of the immediate changes I have made um, to my teaching, I suppose, my approaches. Um, and I really look at looking forward to making a lot more changes and implementing UDL in my teaching and my classroom, whether virtually or in the classroom. So thank you to Carol for inviting me to you all for listening. Brilliant, Niamh, thank you. And, and you know, you're only very new to UDL. It's not that you're new to including your students, we know that, but for myself and Helena, we're at this a few years, so it's that little bit easier, you know? So thank you and thank you. It's not easy being the first raw recruit up either. So. <laughs> Our next person is Rachel. I've worked with Rachel for a number of years now. Um, she's a technical whiz kid, so I, I can't see her right now. Well, I'll rely on Farad. Are you there, Rachel? I am, yeah. Good woman. Farad is going to help out if necessary. Yeah. Rachel is going to show you a clip. Um, and I'll just back out of the way now as best I can. Thanks very much. So I just give a very brief background and introduction there. I, I, I hope I'd love to think that I wasn't an, an, an IT or AT whiz, but it doesn't feel like that a lot of the time. Um, so I started in CSN in 2001 and in uh, 2008, I took up um, AP1 roles and uh, I've had a variety of roles, but one of those was as a disability officer. And as part of that um, role, I had to attend lots of conferences and I was learning about alternative teaching, alternative strategies, um, but it was all in the really area of uh, special ed needs really. And, um, but I also got this interest in assistive technology through these conferences. And then myself, I, I developed, I was unfortunate enough to develop something called fibromyalgia and I, I've had chronic pain for years and I, I couldn't type for a long time. So I got very familiar with using Dragon myself and to be honest with you, it was a lifesaver. And um, I also have a kind of uh, Ireland syndrome in one of my eyes. So I have uh, huge problems with black text on white paper background. So I have understanding about what many of the students might face as challenges, but luckily I'm not challenged by that one myself, uh, uh, thankfully. Um, I would have taught about uh, universal design in my equality um, and disability components, which is really interesting. I, I had never thought of it as a UDL. I, was, I taught about uh, universal design in terms of buildings, objects um, and services and things. But I obviously was implementing UDL strategies, but initially, as I said, predominantly focused on special educational needs students. And in the last couple of years, I came to realize that this has come full circle and often a lot of the um, flexibility in teaching, learning, and in students showing what they know that we're trying to apply with students with special needs, that actually works and benefits all students across CSN. So this is the point where I was at last year when I uh, was given uh, the teamwork co component to teach to the acting for screen and stage students. Now I've an art background myself, um, so I'll tell you, I just thoroughly enjoyed meeting this class of arty, creative, lateral thinking students. But unfortunately, they, some of them also came to the, to the classroom with very weak um, reading and writing skills. And they really, really struggled um, with the component, um, this co teamwork and component. And Fred, if you can there, because I can't seem to make my screen live, if you can just show, I sent a little JPEG there of the marking scheme for teamworking, 
um, if you have that just for a second there. Sorry, no, I can't find it. Uh, did you That's okay. I'll talk my way through it. Um, so the first marking sheet then, the collection of work, it's looking for um, two essays basically, and there was no way out of it. We had been flexible in other areas, allowing students to submit audio and video um, 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 feedback basically, but we had to stick with this essay format for this particular component. So, um, what I did last year, Lucy Phelan, she works in study support, she showed me this dictate tool that um, was coming up with the with the uh, new Office 365, I think, uh, Office 365 um, version of Word. I don't know what that is there now. And um, I thought this was a really good idea, but it wasn't, um, you know, it was probably focused on one to one uh, teaching of students who were coming in for extra study support. This year, then, when all of our students moved um, on to Office 365, and I'd agree there uh, strongly with Liz, it's been such a fantastic transition. Um, I came up with this idea of um, um, bringing this fantastic tool, this dictate tool on Word, where students can talk into their phones, they can talk into the laptops, and Word will type up the text for them. I thought that I'd make some videos and make this uh, these videos available for students. I also made a second video, I haven't it here now, but it was about read aloud, so that students can read back what they've typed up. And as I said, this traditionally would be um, IT or AT for students with special education needs. I've learned myself that this is benefit for for everybody. Um, so, um, Farad, if you have the, the little video there, I'll show it. Um, I hope it comes across as it's very calm and relaxed. This was probably in version 49 at about half two in the morning. I was nearly <laughs> to, <laughs> to give up. But this, if Farad has it there, I, I think you do, do you, Farad? The video. No, I, have it, I have it here. I'll try and see if I can share my screen there and see if I if I have it there first. I have no. it here. Oh, great. So, Karen, if you would share it. If if you can, yeah, I, I, hold on two seconds. Now. I mean, uh, we will get up. Which one is it? Hold on for a second. Dumpty dumpty dum. Trying to multitask several things at a time is just so interesting. Written work difficult. There you go. Okay, we'll have to stop you and rewind you again. <laughs> oh, well, come back. Know. It would be great. Come back, come back, come back. Can you see that though? No. No, so I must share a shit. Sorry, guys. That's okay. No. We're used to doing this like a, a classroom scenario. So it's uh, I'm there you go. Questions. Cool. So one, two, three, go. We all find written work difficult sometimes. Full stop. It would be great if someone could do the work for you. Exclamation mark. It would be even better though, comma, if you could speak into your device and it do the typing for you, exclamation mark. Well, comma, in Office 365's version of Word, comma, you can do just that, full stop. Let me show you how it works, full stop. So when you uh, go into Office 365 and launch Microsoft Word and select a new blank document, it automatically opens up on the home tab. And if you go over here to the right, you will see the dictate button. Click the drop down menu and select dictate. Once you do this, it will begin listening to what you're saying and will type what you are saying. To turn off dictation, just click on the microphone again. To the left of the microphone are your settings options. You can go in and change your language and you can also decide to use voice commands like new line, full stop, new paragraph, etc. And there's also an auto punctuation feature too. To the right of the microphone is a help feature. When you click on that, this uh, bar opens up and there are drop down sections that you can read and get more information about how to start dictation, making corrections, um, punctuation, editing and formatting. Have a read through this and decide how much or how little of it that you want to take on. If you launch Dictate in uh, the desktop app version of Word, it looks a little bit different, but works pretty much the same. Again, Word will launch with the Home tab live and over on the right hand side, you will see the Dictate button. When you click on this, it will start to listen. 
now it will type what I am saying. I click here again to turn it off. The drop down menu underneath here will give you your language and settings. And that's about it. So I hope you try Dictate and I hope you find it useful in your assignments. Thanks, Carol. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. So I thought it was really important that when it started that it showed the student what, how, what the tool was doing to hopefully bring them in and get them to watch the rest of the tool and get the information. Um, and I've linked in with other teachers now in CSN who are also doing their UDL badge. Um, Denise is uh, setting up a kind of a study support a platform and these videos are going to go up there. I sent them out to all my my students. I sent them out to course directors. I sent them out to uh, students who are registered with disability and I'm waiting to get feedback. I, I haven't um, gotten that far yet, but I got four, uh, I asked um, last night and I got four students came back and they said that they were using it and they found it really helpful for their assignments. Um, so I'm delighted about that. So that is my presentation. Amazing, Rachel, as always. Thank you very much. Um, I'm thank conscious you. that we're really, really running out of time. Um, so do we have Angela? I know I saw your name up there a while ago. Are you ready to roll? Yes, Carol. Hi, how are you? Okay, hi, my name is Angela Fahi. I work in Kinsale College as a personal assistant. And, you know, we work very hard to ensure that everyone is facilitated and that all needs are first of all recognized and then accommodated. So working in this environment and being involved in that culture where everyone's feeling valued, no matter what the starting point, for me, it's created an enormous feel good factor. Coming to work is by and large an, an enjoyable experience, an experience and you know, it, is, it just feels really good to work with such a variety of people and a variety of needs. In the couple of years I've worked in the college, I've um, noticed that a lot of students are not that knowledgeable about technology and are very nervous about using it. So a colleague, another PA, Gail and myself sat down and we thought about, you know, how we can help. And, you know, generally these people what would be returning to education or perhaps from, you know, non English speaking countries and would be very daunted by you know, using technology, may not have used laptops before. So, you know, would require help even just with turning it on. So showing them how to organize their data so that they can easily retrieve it, creating folders in OneDrive, creating subfolders, showing them how to organize themselves so that documents aren't lost. You know, perhaps creating subfolders for each module, that sort of thing. Getting them started off on that footing, I think, you know, really helps them down the road, you know, with just pure organization. Um, then we decided that, you know, if we just created a basic step by step document, um, showing them how to open a document in Word, how to retrieve it, how to save it and how to store it would help enormously and and get rid of some of the fear factor. And then, you know, you have a situation where you've people coming to college and it's such a new experience, it's very frightening. And it, it actually includes learning a whole new language. Things like words like brief, assignment, bibliography, they, they're not words that people, a lot of people are used to. So not to mention the technological terms that they would be coming across. So to try and remove some of the fear of that, creating a template for a standard assignment was, you know, a way that we thought might help. Now, Rachel obviously spoke about this. So similarly to what she was saying, just creating, a, not every assignment of course can be done in this way, but a lot of them can. So you can create the headers and footers, you can create the, the headings, you can, you know, you know, introduction, aim, rationale, conclusion, all of these things can be preset in the document to allow the user to go in and just fill it in, you know, just to where they know where they're going, giving them structure. And I just think this is, it's one way of helping to, to make a level playing field for everyone and to give learners, you know, just to give them that bit of help to hit the ground running when they begin their studies in a very new environment for a lot of them and it would help to alleviate pressure and stress. And, you know, I, I've noticed that they are very, very grateful, especially when you set them up 
but they, you know, when you're helping them on their laptop and you're creating the folders and giving them that sense of they know where they're going and they have a better idea of what they're doing. So that's it. That's me. Thank you so much, Angela. I'm, I'm very, very welcome. Um, and for all your help with the young men earlier on as well. They were uh, delighted. They're gone home, but they were yeah. thrilled. Yeah. And I'm delighted because I remember how disappointed Liz was when they when you know, went with the head conference and all the COVID and everything else. And it was just going to be too much to have them present in public, you know, in Dublin or not. I'm sorry, present online, I should say. Um, Sarah Walsh was having difficulty getting on board with links and stuff. Are you there, Sarah? I don't see her. So while we're waiting to see if Sarah comes in, Nula, are you ready to roll? Yes, Carol, I'm ready. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, my love, yes. Can you see me? I can't see you just yet. Okay. I'm here as well, Carol, sorry. Okay, Sarah, all yeah. right. Um, oh, okay. Which I sent her my link so she was able to get in. Okay, thank you. So that's the... Yeah, because I've been emailing it through for the last few minutes, but it, it just wasn't going. It wasn't coming through. So, um, Sarah, do you want to go first? So it was your turn. Sorry, Nula. Yeah. Sorry, Nula. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, very similar to the last two speakers, Angela and Rachel, I um, had to, I redesigned my activity. Um, it was, it's the communications um, ICT assignment. Um, it's a research project and it's 1,000, or sorry, it's 1,000 words or 1,200 words. And the students are really intimidated by it. And again, I couldn't change it, couldn't use UDL for the assessment because it's in the module descriptor. Um, so what I did was to use the UDL to just change the way I present the, um, the work for the students. Um, so um, I give them, I always gave them a basic writing frame anyway, but, um, and we used to do a kind of um, brainstorming session on the different types of, uh, of how the, how, so basically the, the assignment is on the three different areas of life, like work, um, social and study. Uh, areas and how um, ICT has impacted on those areas. So I used to just do a brainstorming session on the positives and negatives of that. And then the students would head off, which was quite engaging, like they were really interacted well. But then when they'd go off to do their research, they were like rabbits in a headlight um, and they wouldn't know where to start. So, I mean, I did give them a basic writing frame, but what I'm doing now is um, giving them the writing frame um, with the subheadings, but giving them um, suggested word counts for each section and um, a tick box so that when they're finished one section they can tick it off and then it just breaks it down into sort of bite-sized more manageable pieces um, so um, then I give them a section where they have to do a history kind of just to put a little bit of context into their assignment and in the past they used to, the students would go off onto Wikipedia and I'd get these massive essays that were nearly a thousand words just on hieroglyphics and cave paintings. So now what I'm doing with UDL is giving them lots of different um, ways of um, accessing the information in a more kind of concise way. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, I have a visual timeline, and I have links to different YouTube videos. Um, and then I'm using um, yeah, the timeline. There's one student who has dyslexia and dysgraphia. So she really hates reading or writing of any kind. So she's using, uh, she's also using that text to speech to text technology. And she's using the, um, the visual timeline almost as like kind of a, uh, like a plan for her history section. So she's just, she's watched the videos. She has her head around the history of communication and she's just dictating her her assignment. So it's really positive. Um, for the three areas, instead of doing just the um, brainstorming session, we have three PowerPoint presentations on the different areas, comparing how ICT used to be then and now, and positives and negatives, um, has links to videos. And at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, I've given them suggested um, search um, keys, you know, for their, depending on what search engine they're using so that they don't get lost in their searches, kind of make their 
research much more focused. So um, uh, yeah, it's actually been really good so far. And I've also used it in other areas um, of, this, of the communications course with a different group uh, in terms of how they present their work. And um, I've been letting them do written, written work on their novel or they can give me um, pictures or they can give me PowerPoint presentations. So it's been really, really engaging with it. And uh, there's definitely been a lot less moaning and groaning since I've been using UDL in the youth reach classroom. So it's, I'd highly recommend it. Thank you, Sarah. That's Sarah Walsh from East Cork Youth Reach that we've been talking or listening to there, not for ad. But, um, so um, uh, no pressure down Nula Glanton, but uh, we probably kept the best till last, did we? <laughs> I think you really for saying that. Um, so Nula is one of our examples. We have several people on board of uh, people in a managerial position as opposed to a teacher in a classroom um, teaching. So she's going to give you a flavour of something that she's doing to promote UDL in her realm. Off you go, Nula. You'll be delighted to hear. I'll be very brief. Um, I um, decided to do the UDL digital badge because I'm really interested in UDL. I think it's such a simple idea. It makes so much sense and it makes such a difference. So I would encourage all teachers and tutors, instruct all staff in Cork ETB to do it. Um, there's a lot to learn from it. It was a bit of a challenge when I'm not teaching and it was focused on teaching. I'm not teaching at the moment. So I was thinking, could I get a class somewhere to teach? How would I uh, do my redesign activity? Um, I, and then things started getting very complicated in my head and I tend to, to run away with things. Um, Carol brought me back to reality, which was great. It was very reassuring. She just told me to keep it simple and to just change one thing. I was trying to incorporate all the UDL principles into one activity, which, which would have been impossible. Um, but Carol's guidance made it very simple. Um, she clarified as well that the course, the digital badge is about changing your mindset. And it, it has changed my mindset about how to communicate and um, how to engage with people uh, in, in my work, not, not in a teaching practice. So it's well worth doing even if you're not teaching. So for my redesign activity, after a lot of de deliberation, I decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with like a cheat sheet or a style guide for clear communication. So I'm, I've looked at three documents. I've just shared them there in the chat. So um, the, the first element is plain English. Nala has a very good plain English guide and the one for the, civil, the public service there is very good. So just to use clear, simple language. I suppose when I, uh, what I had in mind was communicating with YouthReach students and I'm going to encourage my colleagues in YouthReach to, to use it. Just clear, simple sentences, simple words, make everything as clear as possible. And the other element then for clear communication is um, the, um, sorry, the, the font size, the clear print guidelines. So to use large font, minimum of 12, um, come up with a, a kind of a standard template. So agree the format, um, heading one will be this, heading two will be that, the normal text will be this, to use a sensory font um, uh, with spacing between the words. So this is all in my head at the moment. I haven't actually done it. Um, that's why I'm, I'm being so brief, but um, I am planning to consult with my colleagues and run it by a few um, students as well to get their input into it. Um, so I have a bit of work to do on the, my redesign activity, um, but I would encourage everyone to do it. It's, it's really interesting. You can do it in your own time and the assignment is not that daunting. You can make it as simple as you want to. So I leave it there, Carol. Brilliant, Nuna. Thank you very much, somebody. And, and, and thank you so much for um, your managerial input into all of this. We do have, as I said, a good few people that are not um, your ordinary teacher uh, doing this, which is brilliant. I, I really think somebody there in the chat said this should be nearly mandatory training. I was part of um, training years ago, which is now um, Drihid, you know, where the teachers come out with their HDIP and they have to do, isn't it, uh, 10 out of the 12 components. I used to be one of the facilitators at that at the beginning. Um, this UDL training would have been brilliant if it was part of it at that stage. Um, somebody else um, said, is the UDL training going to happen again? 
yes, this group are going to finish, finish on the 10th of December. There's a whole lot of these people that are also training to be facilitators. So we'll have more and more facilitators like myself and, and 20 odd others of us around the country at the moment um, to roll out that digital badge closer to home for people. I'm quite sure uh, the people in the head, Trevor and Dara and Christine would be more de than delighted to hear. Um, and um, Lisa Patton in UCC would be more than happy to hear about from people who want to um, take up that badge. Certainly you can get on to me and, and I can connect you with other people as well. Um, so thank you. If anyone else has anything they'd like to say or do in or, or comment on in, in for any of our presentations, um, we'll give about one more minute and see does anything come up and I have questions on one side and chat on the other. Nothing's moving yet. Okay, I'm conscious that it is. Um, Hi, Karen. Yes, oh, go on. Go on. <laughs> sorry. sorry, just I just had a couple of people just messaging me there about that video. Would it be possible to, if they people were interested, to um, use that dictate video and the read aloud if they were interested in having it? That's up to you, my love. Absolutely okay. up to you. Okay, super. Okay. If anybody is interested, I can I can email it to you afterwards. Yeah, and, thanks and very much. Can, thanks I will have all a list of all the attendees and that I can send it out as well if you want that way. Yeah, um, thanks very much, Karen. Lovely. Anyone else? Okay, so I'd like to thank so, so, so thank everybody that took part and all the people that were going to and got shuffled around to different days. A huge, enormous, humongous thank you to Farad because I don't think I would have been remotely as calm as I was um, if he hadn't been there. Um, Thank you again to Kinsale. You really are the, the leaders in all of this, even within the Cork ETB. Okay, and to you, Liz, for bringing us all here and all your hard work over the years. The next session is this day week. We're going to have Lucy Phelan from CSN talking about, um, you know, the beginning of inclusion and UDL and how that happened in her college and now how it's impacting her personally. The next session will be with Trevor Boland and Lorraine Gallagher from AHEAD, and they're going to give us a session on um, technological stuff that is suitable for teachers. After that, we have two, another duet, and we have Sharon McCarthy and we have a, a psychologist, Michaela, from North Lee, um, who are going to talk to us about working with autistic learners and people with anxiety, not just autistic people with anxiety, but everybody who is, who is anxious. And then the last piece is going to be a piece on mental health, because an awful lot of people with mental health have been um, upset, uh, further marginalised, whatever you would like to say, um, because of all this COVID and all of this um, stuff that's happening. So anybody who wants to leave, please feel free to do so. As promised earlier, I'm going to press play on this recording of our Champions of Disability from uh, way back when. And um, we hope we will see many of you and many of your friends um, and colleagues next week. Same time, same place. So here we go. Uh, let's share the wrong thing. Okay. Uh, two seconds. So let me get rid of that one. Just at the last minute, things don't go perfectly okay. Okay, that's not what I want either. Come up. Carol, if you send me the, the link, I'll share it on mine. Yeah, I have it here. I just got it. Thank you, but thank you. You're very kind. Why do I have Liz? The link, the, the link wouldn't share. I remember years ago sending it to Christine for um, um the conference where I have it. And it wouldn't go because the file was too big. 
So here we doing go. the you know the digital badge for Universal Design for Learning. One of the things that really struck me most was the little changes that I made. And it didn't just benefit, you know, the students with disabilities. These changes that I made benefited everybody. And I was surprised that I was actually hearing it had the, the biggest impact maybe on people that I hadn't expected. It's the mature learners returning to education after 20 years. Um, you know, um, and I suppose the, the very diverse group of learners that we have, um, it's learning to how to make everybody feel included. Well, I've noticed in the classroom there is a, a greater need, much more diversity in the classroom, and I, I need to be uh, in touch with that as a teacher, but also personally, I've been teaching for a few years now, and I'd like to be involved in something new, something different to freshen up my career, and it's certainly been very positive in that very much hands-on approach. So getting the students to take ownership of their own learning, that was definitely the big thing. And that has empowered them and gives them more confidence. Um, and, you know, kind of handing it back to them almost, going, you know, this is not just my class, this is your class. And always, the one thing I definitely took from this, I suppose, experience as well, was asking the students going, you know, this is what I'm thinking of doing, how do you feel about that? So at the start, I was like, oh God, a report, a case study, it's going to take a lot of work, but it was invaluable. I introduced a video tutorial for students that didn't have um, the software at home to do their bookkeeping. It was a very simple thing, but I suppose it, it provided such a support for them in their own pace. And the digital badge for me was fabulous. And it was something that I would look into for other modules next year, just providing support, simple. And I just hadn't done it before. I've been able to adapt, adapt my mindset and look at things differently, look at students differently. Um, I'm thinking of an instance there was a student asleep on the desk. And in the past, I might have reacted instinctively to that. But um, it was pointed out to me that this student has uh, autism. They probably needed time out. They need to centre themselves. And that's how they manage that. So having known that, I can take a little space and... Um, I won't just react. Thank you. So folks, to all 42 of you still here, that was it. That was the video. Thank you so, so, so much for being here. And we really do hope you'll be back next week and that you'll bring lots more people with you. Thank you. The trio. <laughs> How are you doing, Liz? You must be. Uh... I'm very good. Yeah, the boys were great, weren't they? The boys were great. Yeah. And I just got a lovely text there from Andrew. They were happy out going home. Good, good. I'm delighted. I really am. Thanks, Cora. Thank you, John. Take care and safe home. Safe home, says Carol. He probably is home. It's, isn't it strange when people are saying goodbye and, and they're probably just sitting in their living room. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Karen, you, Karen. Karen yeah. Thank she you. was one of the first people in today. Um, she was in well before and, and lots of people. She's our one of our champions. Thanks, Cora, as well. She's, I know her as well. <laughs>